What a wonderful way to start the day. Good morning and welcome to worship this day. It's good to see you all here. A couple of announcements. One, Jeff would like to thank those who volunteered on Monday for loaves and fishes. Thanks to Cindy, Rick, Harry, and Kirsten for serving, Dave and Deb for making sure there was food to serve, and to St. Mark's, thank you for uh, continued financial support of this much needed service. There were 114 meals that were served and the numbers are still down from last year. The need is still there. And over this past year, more than 30,000 meals have been served at the Christ the King site alone. So thank you for that. Um, also a thanks to all who showed up yesterday for our annual spring cleanup day. Here is the list of items that we needed to accomplish, and you may not be able to see it from there, but every single one is checked off. So a lot of people came. It was a beautiful day inside and out. We got a lot taken care of, so thank you for all of that work. Just a reminder that this coming Saturday is the memorial service for Lois Shorley. So the memorial service is at 11 a.m. Visitation is at 10, and then there will be a light luncheon following the service. So that is this coming Saturday. Are there any other announcements? If not, then I invite you to take a breath in and a breath out to calm your hearts and minds as we prepare for worship this day. I invite you to join me in the call to worship. Sing a new song, full of incredible joy, gracious healing, and comfort for those who mourn. Sing praise to God, a strong song of springtime glory and sunny renewal. Sing loud and clear, for God brings rainbows after storms butterflies after cocoons. Let all the waterfalls clap their hands and the mountains and hills ring with gladness. For Christ is risen and rules the world with truth and grace. Heaven and nature sing, for the Savior reigns and the wonders of God's love are everywhere. Together let us join our voices in the opening hymn, Morning Has Broken.
Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we give thanks to you for the gift of life and breath, the gift of gathering this morning. Bless us as we hear your word, as we lift our songs of praise and our prayers up to you. Strengthen and nurture us and send us out to be a people of hope, a people of love. In your name we pray. Amen. Let us confess our sins before God and one another in the prayer of confession. Redeeming God, you bring life out of dead ends and hope in the midst of despair. Forgive us for doubting that you are still at work, even in the darkest hour, even in the most painful moments. Forgive us for our hesitant action, our cautious compassion, our too frequent reluctance. Teach us the stillness that leads to acts of kindness and clarity of vision. Shape in us a trust that leads to faithful witness and bold compassion. Form us in your love that loosens our worry and eases our anger. Make us true disciples filled with love, acting with justice, and living out hope. Amen. I invite you to a moment of silent confession. Amen. Here are these words of assurance that God, who indeed hears our confession of sin, forgives us and invites us to live life anew. Friends, believe in the gospel, but in Christ we are forgiven. This is good news indeed. Thanks be to God. Amen. As brothers and sisters who share Christ's love, let us exchange signs of peace with one another. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let us share the peace. So as you all gather back, I invite the young people to come on up. What do you suppose? Is A oh, here comes Ace. 
Do you suspect that we're going to see him walk up these aisles one day? I think so. Not sure when, but we'll see. We'll see. Someday. Yes. Well, good morning. Good morning. I'm so glad to see you. I have something in my hands. I'm going to show it to the congregation as well. What do you suppose this is? A bubble wand. A bubble wand could be. Mm -hmm. A hoop. A hoop. Some might call it the magical looking glass. The magical looking glass. That is exactly what it is. Ding, Wait, ding, ding. Serious. From Romper Room. Okay. Right? You knew you were thinking of Romper Room? I actually thought it was a bubble wand too. Well, you thought it well. <laughs> it can be anything with imagination. But this morning, it is a magical looking glass because there was a show that was started before I was born, but I saw reruns called Romper Room. You guys ever seen Romper Room? I'm pretty young for it. I don't even know if that you can see it anymore. Anyways, it was a show for preschool mostly, young kids. And at the end of the show, the hostess would take this and she would say, Romper, Bomper, Stomper, Do. Tell me, tell me, tell me true. And she would look through it and say, I see Evelyn, and I see Rowan, and I see Ace, and I see Cody. And she would name off the kids that would be watching from home. How do you think she knew their names? Could she really see them? Well, it's a magical looking glass. Maybe she could. What do you see when you look through it? Congregation. You see the congregation. What do you see when you look through it? Uh, ace. You see Ace. If I give this to you, might you want to chew on it, Ace? Probably. Yeah. So, one of the things that we're going to be talking about the scripture today is how the disciples see people. And we can talk about how Jesus saw people. So, I see Evelyn, but you know what else I see? What? A child of God. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. How about here? Rowan, but also... Are you a child of God? You are! <gasps> how about Ace? Look through there. Do you see a child of God? Yes. I see a child of God. How about if we look through this and see the congregation? Do we see children of God? Yes, we are all God's children and all loved by God. And that's how Jesus saw everybody as a beloved child of God. And Jesus loved them because they were beloved of God. So that is how we are called to look at others. We all look a little bit different, right? But we are all children of God and loved. So sometimes it's hard to see one another that way, but that's what we're called to do. So let's say a word of prayer. Thank you, God, for calling each of us beloved children. Help us to see one another in that way and help us to love as you did. In your name we pray. Amen. Romper, bumper, stomper, do. Tell me, tell me, tell me true. It's time to go back. But I'll see you after worship for snacks, all right? Okay. Thanks for coming up. How many in the congregation used to watch that? A little bit. A little bit? Yeah, a few. I saw a few reruns, and we didn't have cable when I was a kid, so we didn't uh, get to see many shows, but I have seen a few. The scripture reading for this day comes from the book of Acts, chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and a man lame from birth was being carried in. 
People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood up and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This ends today's reading. So last week, as most of you know, I was in Pennsylvania getting ready to attend a concert of the State College Choral Society. I flew in on Saturday to surprise Jocelyn and it totally worked. She was completely surprised. It was a wonderful time spent together hearing Haydn's creation with the orchestra and the solos and the choir and just being together. Because I was gone, Molly was here last week, and she preached on the Lucan text called, often called, the road to Emmaus. Two of the disciples are walking on the road to Emmaus, and they encounter a stranger who walks with them. And the two disciples, in turn, share the events of the last few days, namely the death and resurrection of Jesus, with this man who seemingly is unaware of what has been going on. It is only when they break bread with Jesus around the campfire that night that the disciples' eyes are opened and they recognize the one with whom they were walking was Jesus himself. This week and for the next few weeks, we will be reading from the book of Acts, the story of the early church written, believed to be written by the same one who wrote the Gospel of Luke. It is in a way Luke part two. The first chapter of Acts tells the story of Jesus' ascension to heaven to go sit at the right hand of the Father and the instruction for the disciples to go to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit. The second chapter of Acts tells the story of Pentecost, the gifting of that Holy Spirit that will be read on May 19th. So in way, chapter one is wait for the Holy Spirit, it will come to you, chapter two, the Holy Spirit has come, chapter 3, and much of really the rest of the book of Acts address the question, okay, so now what? Peter and John are going to the temple to pray. It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon, one of the prescribed times of prayer. While much has changed for those disciples, in other ways life continues on as it had before. As they approach one of the gates to enter into the temple, the beautiful gate, it is called, they see a man lying there asking for alms. The Greek word here echoes the word for mercy. We know from later on in the book of Acts that this man is around 40 years old. The text doesn't tell us any details about the situation. His physical condition isn't due to an accident. There's no connection to sinfulness as there is in other stories. You can imagine that perhaps his family provided for him while he was young, but at some point he was left to himself to beg for his very survival. This is the life that he has always known and he wouldn't expect it to ever change. Perhaps he chose to be laid at the temple gate because those who would be making their way to prayer might remember that while worship and prayer to God are important, equally important is caring for the least of these. 
Perhaps by lying near a temple gate, those who would pass by on their way to prayer would be especially generous. It's a smart move. Imagine that if at St. Mark's there was a person or family asking for money or food or shelter. They would be hard to ignore as we drove up the driveway to St. Mark's, even harder if they were at our doors. Would we be annoyed? Would we be compassionate? Would we be uncomfortable? Since the beginning of time, there have been people who have needed help, food or shelter or support. The Old Testament is filled with the commandments to care for orphans and widows and the foreigner, all those most vulnerable. Jesus even said, you will always have the poor with you. People asking for money is a very familiar sight, especially in bigger cities, whether Los Angeles or San Diego or Minneapolis. Every time we go downtown for a concert or sporting event, there are numerous people on the street, sometimes with signs, sometimes without. Sometimes they will approach you directly. Hey, do you have any money? Do you have any change to spare? Sometimes they just sit on the sidewalk with all of their belongings in an outstretched hand or a cup, not even looking at you. Over the past few years, I have noticed more and more folks asking for money in Bloomington. Have you noticed this? They're often standing at major street corners or boulevards holding up signs, will work for food or homeless, please give. Sometimes they have a backpack with them. Sometimes they have a dog. Sometimes a bike. It is uncomfortable as well as heartbreaking. What has happened in their life that led them to this place, to being desperate enough to stand on the street corner? I imagine that they would have never imagined they'd be there either. Some are struggling with addiction, some are fleeing abusive situations, some just can't afford to make rent. Most of their stories we will never know. And I have long struggled with how to respond. Should I give money? How much money? And to who? Everyone that I encounter? I usually don't carry cash, so I'd have to go and withdraw cash and then put it in an envelope and have it readily accessible each time. Does $5 really make a difference? Yes. Will the money be used for alcohol or drugs? I don't know. Do I have any control? No. Maybe I should create care kits instead, Ziploc baggies filled with a few essentials that are ready to hand out. Or maybe we should stop, I should stop at McDonald's and order an extra meal to give, ready to hand out, or protein bars, or bottles of water. Do I have time to do that when I'm on the way to somewhere else? Is it safe? The man at the temple sees Peter and John, and he calls out to them. They not only hear them, they not only hear him, they see him. The text says that they look intently at him. So many others probably walked right by, but Peter and John stop and say, look at us. It is a small ask. It is a hard ask. Perhaps the man keeps his eyes lowered out, of res lowered out of respect for Peter and John. Perhaps he keeps his eyes lowered out of shame or embarrassment. Do we look at those on the street corner who are asking for something, or do we avert our eyes? Do we switch lanes so that we're not so close to them? Do we walk on the other side of the street? Do we read their handmade signs? When people come up to us, do we really see one another? Do we see our similarities or do we only see our difference? Do we look upon those in need with disdain or dislike, sometimes fear? 
or with eyes of compassion or mercy. Yes to all. What do those in need see when they look at us? Do they see indifference? Do they see disdain? Do they see privilege? Do they see compassion? Yes. Looking one another in the eye is difficult. I wonder if this is not part of the increase in self-serve checkouts at the grocery stores. Sometimes people would just rather avoid people altogether, avoid eye contact, avoid conversation. One of my favorite Facebook sayings recently that gets posted fairly often says, staying inside today, it's very people-y out there. And in some cultures, direct eye contact is considered disrespectful. Yet Peter and John see this man for who he is, and Peter says to him, I have no money, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And the man jumps up and begins to walk. This man, lame from birth, would have never expected this or even hoped for it. He couldn't even have imagined this was possible. After all, these guys aren't Jesus. Yet, they have healed him in the name of Jesus. Peter and John give credit where credit is due. Did the disciples know that they could do this? I wonder if they weren't surprised as well. I wish I could do that. Although I have to confess, notice the use of one of my favorite star words, I have never really tried, not in that way at least. I can name people, people you know, people I know, whom I would fix my attention upon intently and say the words, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk or be healed of cancer or Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or on and on and on, and they would be healed just like that. I've seen it, at least on TV. In the midst of a worship service, the preacher, almost always a man, invites those who are unable to walk or who are suffering from an affliction to come to the front of the church, and he lays hands on them and he forcibly says, healed, and they fall back and they are healed. Does this really happen? Maybe. What if... What happens if everyone truly and deeply believes that the one in need will be healed and then are not? While it is true that miracles, big and small, happen every day, they are just that, a miracle, unexpected, unpredictable, uncontrollable. Being healed, being cured is not dependent upon how much faith one has as Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew, the sun rises on the good and the evil, rain on the righteous and unrighteous alike. Cancer does not discriminate. Affliction does not discriminate. Heartbreak does not discriminate. There are so many and have been so many faith-filled people who have lived with and died from illness and disease. God does not give us cancer as a test of faith or as a punishment for sin. Yet having faith matters. Another Facebook post recently said it well. It said, it's not that God won't give you more than you can handle, but that God will help you handle all that you have been given. Faith and trust in God gets us through the most difficult situations in life. This I know to be true. I've seen it. You've witnessed it to me. This I believe. The man leaps up and enters the temple with Peter and John praising God all the way. And all who saw this man, all those who knew that he had been lame from birth, knew that he used to sit at the beautiful gate begging for alms day after day, year after year, 
were filled with wonder in amazement. Isn't this the man? It isn't hard to imagine that this testimony of his healing quickly spreads. And in fact, the next verse, the ones that we did not read, Peter uses the healing to proclaim the good news of Jesus. This is a healing story to be sure. The man lame from birth is healed, but it is more than a story about healing. It is a story about restoration and about seeing. Do you recall the story of the hemorrhaging woman who touched the fringes of Jesus' cloak in the midst of a crowd and was healed? Because of her bleeding for 12 long years, we are told, she would have been considered unclean. She wouldn't have been allowed to join in the community in worship or in the everydayness of life. She would have been isolated from friends and family. And in the act of healing, she was restored back to community. The same is true with the man lame from birth. While we are told that people, friends perhaps, would lay him daily at the beautiful gate, he wasn't allowed in the temple. His condition rendered him unable, not just literally, but also because he was not whole to join in community with others in worship. And the first thing that the man does is rise up and join Peter and John in the temple. This text invites us to consider how we see others, especially those who live on the margins. Peter and John looked upon the man with compassion and responded in kind. They saw not only a man lame from birth, but they saw a beloved child of God. They looked at the world. They looked at humanity through the eyes of Jesus, the one whom they proclaimed and followed. This work continues today. We are called to do the same. The issues of homelessness and need may well be with us until the end of time, and they're complicated issues indeed, issues that need all of us. But perhaps a first step is to truly see one another, even though we might be tempted to look away. We can use what we have to love one another, not just those we know and love, but all of God's children. We can draw the circle larger to include those excluded, those pushed to the margins, those overlooked. And in so doing, we witness with our lives our faith in the one who calls us beloved and holds all of us in life and death. Thanks be to God. Amen. We have been richly blessed so that we might be a blessing to others. Let us share from our abundance our gifts of time and money, prayers, and energy. You're invited to give to the mission and ministry of this church and the wider church by donating either directly to the church via mail, placing an offering in the offering plates, or via PayPal on our website. And we thank you for your generosity. We'll continue this morning with an opportunity to share any joys or concerns as the body of Christ. Are there any particular joys or concerns people would like to share this day? I just have one joy to share with you. Uh, well, actually, in a prayer concern. So on Tuesday, Jocelyn's fiance, Brian, is defending his thesis. It's a little bit of anxiety time. He shouldn't be have gotten to that point without him being able to pass it. But still, as any of you know who've done anything like that, even just passing a test, there's a little bit of anxiety until it happens. So prayers for calm. And confidence we will be able to zoom in and attend it virtually which we're very excited to do that but that happens on Tuesday the other joy is that well actually I have two joys thinking of Scott John's friend whom we've been praying for that had the stroke almost 10 years ago now is finally able to start walking with both feet so he the synapses in his brain are starting to heal I mean, it's been a long time coming, and it's been walking has been very, very difficult. 
And just this last week, he started taking one step forward with both sides, which is really incredible. Um, the other joy is that I asked Rowan to pull all of the orange sticks in our yard out. Those sticks are placed for the snowplow people. And so the joy is, I think we might be done with snow. We might not, but I'm going with we are done with snow and we're pulling the sticks out. So the joy of the spring. Are there any others this day? If not, then I invite us to a time of silent prayer. Holy and loving God, we give thanks to you for hearing all our prayers, the ones that we share with one another and the ones that we whisper only to you in the quiet of our hearts. We give thanks that we can lift up all our worries and fears, all our uncertainties, all our struggles and trials, and that you carry them with and for us. This day we especially lift up to you all who are in need we lift up to you, Brian, as he anticipates this very important presentation. After years of work, we pray for clarity of mind and calmness of spirit. We lift up to all of those whom we see on the streets, all of those who struggle with all kinds of hardships, Help us to see them with eyes of love and compassion. We give thanks, O oh God, for our many blessings. Help us to be grateful each and every day for the blessing of shelter and food, of friendship, of family, of this community. We lift up to you so many in this world right now who are struggling, not only in our communities and our nation, but the world where there is lack of food, where innocents are caught in the middle of a war, where there is uncertainty about whether even there will be a tomorrow. Help us to have compassionate and open hearts. We pray for world leaders who make decisions that affect so many others. We pray that they might work for peace. Help us to trust in that and trust that even out of the seeming dead ends of so many situations, there is hope and possibility and new life. We give thanks for the gift of this warm weather and the promise that spring offers to each of us. We give thanks for the ministry of this church that offers hope and extends the hand of friendship. Be with us as we go throughout our days. Hear all our prayers spoken and unspoken, and hear us as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught all who would follow him. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, 
as we forgive those that sin against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you as able to join in the closing hymn, Now the Green Blade Rises. Please stand. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with kindness and grant you peace this day and forevermore. And let all God's people say, Amen. Amen.